get started here. Welcome everyone who just joined us. Um, welcome to a Q&A with the director and the producer of Lowland Kids, the short film that is part of our climate change and sustainability series that you should have watched um, today, hopefully. So my name is Ginevra. I'm the program coordinator at Sustainable Woodstock. We're a nonprofit founded in 2009, and our mission is to inspire, educate, and empower everyone to live environmentally, economically, and socially responsible lives. So like I said, we, want, we run a climate change and sustainability film festival. Uh, so we show films related to those topics every month, now virtually. Uh, for this month, we screen two short films um, featuring stories of human displacement. Um, I do hope that everyone had a chance to watch both of those. And tonight we'll just be discussing Lowland Kids, which is a documentary telling the story of last teenagers on the Isle de Jean Charles, a sinking island off the coast of Louisiana. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to run through the agenda and how the meeting will operate. Right now we are recording um, and we're on Facebook Live and I will send a recording of this event to anyone who cannot, couldn't attend tonight. Uh, you should be muted and your video should be off. So if you want to ask a question, please type it in the chat box on Zoom. So if you scroll over the screen, the little chat bubble, and if you're watching on Facebook Live, please just type it in the um, comment section of the video. So um, with that, I think I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce our two speakers tonight, who I am very excited to hear from, Sandor Winther and William Krauss. So I'm gonna just read their bios before we get started. Sandra, was born in Copenhagen and based in, is now based in New York. Um, Sandra's style meld documentary and narrative with an emphasis on capturing the stories and pulse of vibrant youth culture and climate focused issues. Her critically acclaimed documentary, Lowland Kids, premiered at South by Southwest in 2019 and screened over 30 major festivals. The film was hailed for its compassionate and intimate portrayal of climate refugees and received several awards, including the Audience Award for Best Documentary at Palm Springs Short Fest and a Cinema Eye Honors nomination for Outstanding Achievement in Nonfiction Short. Uh, she spends part of her time in Puerto Rico where she filmed Shadow of a Hurricane in 2019 as part of Nowness Survival Season, a visual exploration that celebrates the resilient spirit of the Puerto Rican people in the wake of Hurricane Maria. Sandra is currently in development on her first narrative feature and doc slash sci-fi hybrid slated to film in winter 2021. So that's Sandra, the director. And then we have Hi. William. Um, so William Krause's documentary debut, Monster Factory, directed by Tucker Bliss, explores a behind the scene look at the professional wrestling world and cemented his love for the medium. An urge to humanize the impact of climate change resulted in his second documentary, Lowland Kids, which premiered at South by Southwest in 2019. His most recent film, Underplayed, directed by Stacey Lee, premiered in 2020 at the Toronto International Film Festival. William is currently in series development on Monster Factory with Vox Media and his newest project, which follows Olympic climbers to the Tokyo Games. So I am really, really thrilled to welcome <laughs> both of you. I really enjoyed this film um, and I think we're all excited to hear from you and not me. So I will turn it over to you now. Well, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, I think I can start just by talking a little bit about, you know, how we found the story and what we were excited about in terms of, of telling this narrative. Um, William came to me, um, you know, uh, and had been reading the news and, and told me about, you know, sort of, hey, there's this island, Ile de Chien Charles, and they just received or the state of Louisiana just received a $48 million grant under the Obama administration and this location, relocation is set to happen. And, you know, I thought it was a really interesting story and a really, really important one. But at the time we didn't, you know, quite have our subjects. We had a lot of people in mind and we got in touch with, you know, a local person on the island that was able to connect us to some people. Um, and, we went down to the island and we really just went down with like an open heart and an open mind and knocked on a lot of doors and talked to a lot of people. Um, 
And uh, ultimately it was, you know, when we met the Brunei family, which I had sort of already had in my mind that they were an interesting family. I had seen a video of Howard and Juliet uh, from a few years before when they were younger. And I thought it was really interesting to try and explore uh, the youth's perspective on this and their experience and kind of tell this story through their eyes. Of course, I hadn't met Howard and Juliet in person and I didn't even know if they were really gonna be willing to film with us. And we've been told by several people that there was a high likelihood that they wouldn't as much because they're teenagers. And the last thing you want as a teenager is have a you know camera around you at all times. Um, but ultimately, you know, we were able to connect with the Brunei family and, and I was able to sit down with them and hear about their experience. And I think as a crew, and, and I really am so happy that I had William, um, you know, with me in this process. I think as a crew, we were able to, in some ways, like become a part of the family a little bit and make it fun uh, to do this filming, which I think is so important when you're working with young people that have, lost a lot and who are having to speak about things that are really hard to speak about. And, you know, there were many things that we dove into and, and, and many things we talked about in these interviews that they had never talked with anyone outside their family about. So, you know, I was, I was very honored to, to be able to have those conversations with them. And I think as a crew, you know, um, it, that's part of the reason why we were able to create a safe environment for them. Um, and then we did a second trip and we planned that out more. And then we, you know, put a, put an edit together and submitted it to festivals in the hopes that it would do well. And then it's just been amazing to see how it's been received. I think the story has connected with a lot of people. It's connected with a lot of Americans, you know, perhaps despite their political beliefs, I think the film shows that climate change is real and happening and it's sneaking up on you in the night and you know there is no reversing it and you know communities are now being affected in a big way by this and um you know Ildish and Charles is just you know one community out of out of many to come um that will have to um relocate you know Ildish and Charles in a way is they're lucky because the state is helping them and they are, you know, a part of this amazing project, um, as, as you can call it. Um, and hopefully there's a blueprint there for how to relocate communities and Native American communities uh, in the future, you know, in, in other states or uh, in other countries. Um, so I guess that was just like my little short uh, blurb about sort of how we got started. But um, William, why don't you talk a little bit about sort of what you were drawn to in the story and how our first like sort of shoot went and how it developed from there. Yeah, um, you know, I think one of the one of the unique um, hurdles of this project, you know, Sandra and I had to overcome was a lot of people don't understand, but Ilda Jean Charles has been in the media for the last 10 years. Um, Chris has probably done over a hundred interviews on this topic. And I mean, even when Sandra and I are, are down there filming with him, he tells us about other enormous media companies that have just been there maybe even that afternoon. Um, and we will have just missed, you know, CNN or Nat Geo or something like that. And so when we were developing this project from the very beginning, people kept telling us that, um, you know, maybe this story had already been told. Um, and that was, it, it wasn't necessarily something that, you know, some, some younger filmmakers, um, you know, should be spending their time on. Maybe there was another story that hadn't been represented that, that should be told. And, um, and for Sandra and I, I feel like actually that just really motivated us because um, it wasn't that we were ignoring the concerns, but we just felt like the stories that were being told on the island were not actually why we were interested in the story, um, which was, uh, you know, these people on this island, um, they, I think for the, like, one of the more interesting aspects of when we started to really get to know them was that we realized they, re they didn't have, um, they didn't have a clear understanding of what was going on either. Um, they had a lot of opinions, 
Um, but at the end of the day, they were not, they're not, you know, social eco climate change activists. They're just normal people. And, you know, Howard and Juliet are just normal teenagers. And um, this is not something that they wanted to experience. And so we just felt like that was really important for us because we realized that they were the perfect vehicle for um, exploring this topic in not an educational way, but in an experiential way. Um, and fortunately, we just got lucky because that is kind of what ended up happening. I mean, fortunately for Sandra and I, we have the gift of um, of hindsight, which is 2020, and now we 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 get to make make it seem like it was all, um, all it all went according to plan. But um, you know, one of the anecdotes that we talk about was when we original when we went back to film the majority of the shoot. Um, we had kind of we got really excited because it was the first days of summer for them which on our minds was great because it gave us full access to this to Howard and Juliet because they no longer had to be in school. Um, but what we didn't realize is that when you get out of school for the summer, you don't really wanna hang out with a documentary crew. You kinda of wanna go hang out with your, your girlfriend or boyfriend. And so um, I just still remember that, you know, two days into our shoot, we really didn't know what the project was gonna be about. And so, you know, a lot of the insights that we have now are, are lucky because it, it kind of all worked out. Um, but yeah, I think that that's, that's what re has really resonated with everyone about this story. And, and, and we will go into this further, but you know, our aspirations were always to develop this project into a feature film, which is something we're doing now, um, which really follows along the actual physical relocation, which is happening um, right now as we kind of speak um, and they've just laid foundation for the homes and um, the state is building 33 homes um, for some of the islanders and then there's a bunch of other free land um, that they can build on uh, which we can go into further but um, but yeah that's that's kind of that's kind of generally it and I don't I don't know if um, we want to kind of like jump into um you talk Jeff, a little more about the feature maybe or i can just or say you want, yeah feature. go for it um yeah so so like william said it was, it was always the plan that we would that we would do a feature i mean we even thought about as we were making the short should it be longer do we film more you know it also the edit was a bit longer when we submitted it to our first festivals and then everyone was telling us if it's a short doc it should be shorter <laughs> um, for you to get in um and so you know there was a lot of great stuff that we also didn't put in the in the short um and also the short you know a lot of the the tension in the edit was sort of created in post and we weren't with them through an actual hurricane. We weren't with them through like, you know, like this big uh, dramatic change in their lives. And, and, you know, we tried our best and, and we had an incredible editor, Laura Tomaselli, who edited it. And we were able to, I think, sort of you know, feel the story progress and, and sort of be able to peel back the layers of who these people are and what they're going through and what's happening to the place they live in. Um, with the feature, we're hoping that we can really show, you know, the how, 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 how do you actually do this? How do you relocate a community? How do you bring a tribe back together? How do you, um, you know, change a piece of land to resemble a different place because that really is what's happening on this new site uh, which we see at the end of the shore so yeah in the future we're, we're tracking that progress we're seeing the construction we're seeing the houses being built we're going through the emotions with Howard and Juliet who are now in a bit different of a place in their lives as well with bigger responsibilities and and really longing to like you know, make a place their home. You know, Howard has like a, a little family now that he wants to take care of and, and things like that. So there's a lot more at stake. And so we just went down to film like a month and a half ago. Um, and so we filmed for a week and then we're like filming over the course of like the next um, kind of six to eight months um, and tracking that relocation. And, and hopefully, you know, we can make a, a feature that, that um, you know, 
does some of what the short did, I think, emotionally and, and for this issue. So yeah, just to say a little bit more about the, the feature. But yeah, happy to jump into questions and all of that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both for that kind of overview um, of the film. And we've had some people join us since. So I just want to tell folks that um, if you have questions, please enter them in the chat. And on Facebook, please um, put them in the comments of the video so we can ask those questions for you. Um, but yeah, we can we can kind of get started. I'm happy to um, get the ball rolling here, um, or I'm happy for Michael too. But I'll start with um, one question, which you touched on it a bit just now um, in terms of kind of like creating the tension or like the climate, showing the climate catastrophe. But I was just curious because we show so many films on climate um, in our film series. And this film does have a different sort of, um, you know, it's a film about climate, but it's so beautifully shot and it's really focused on humans and people. You could have made it a lot more technical or scientific or scary even. So I was just kind of curious in the choices behind that um, and what you're hoping to achieve for the audience. Yeah, I think the, the biggest sort of surprise or revelation to me when we first set foot on the island was how beautiful and magical the place was, I think you know, in the media, it had sort of been portrayed as like this dire place that's lost a lot of land and it's sinking. And, you know, these people are being moved because where they live is is terrible. And when you go down there, you, that's not the experience you have. It's so peaceful. It's so unique. You're surrounded by water. The sunsets are the most beautiful I've ever seen. Like the trees are the most beautiful. Like you know, and, and, and seeing Howard and Juliet just run around in this like giant backyard and, you know, doing all the things that I wish, you know, kids their age would do more in this day and age, you know, uh, versus sitting inside on their phones and, and playing video games. They are so, so attached to the land they live on and they wake up in the morning and they just want to go outside. And, and so I guess for me, I just saw a lot of beauty in that. It felt very simple, it felt like a simple way of living, but also a way of living where there is an attachment to like the earth um, in a way that maybe other people don't think about as much. And I think that ties back to their Native American roots as well. You know, the place you live isn't, the place you call home isn't necessarily, it's a lot more than a structure. It's like a piece of land. It's somewhere that you know, like the back of your hand, you know, it's that tree, you know, up the bayou, or it's that, you know, you know exactly, you know, like, what kind of rabbits are running around in the area and like, you know, it's just all these little things. And I thought that was really beautiful. And so, and also coming from more of a commercial filmmaking background, um, you know, and, and so, you know, does William, you know, we really took the approach of, okay, let's try and make this really beautiful. Let's try and like do this place and the people justice. And, and um, I think a big part of how we were able to achieve that was to keep it simple, was to, focus on just these two kids and their uncle and kind of saying, okay, this is where we want to be. We want to be with them and we want to see things the way they see it. Um, and I guess that's a little more maybe like a, a narrative approach where you have like, you know, one or two sort of main characters that you're tracking and following and you get to know them very intimately and you're rooting for them. And, and so that really worked out and, and we were able to to also get an amazing DP uh, on the job, Todd Martin, who was able to also achieve, you know, steady cam shots and these very like long, beautiful takes with mosquitoes biting him at all times. <laughs> and, you know, um, so he, he did an incredible job. Um, and I think really ultimately, you know, the film is like a feeling. Um, I think it, it's almost like a, it's like a state you're in when you're watching it. It's like a certain sort of peaceful feeling. And then at the end, we sort of, you know, realize it's sort of like, oh, you know, 
but it's being taken away and this is not where their lives will continue and and i and i think that that way of filmmaking is is hard to achieve it's complex and we spent a lot of time on music composing and we composed all sorts of songs and then in the end went and licensed a lot of them we spent a lot of time in the edit going back and forth and pairing different sound bites with different scenes of course you do that for for every project um but i think we really did it because we felt like okay if we can be in this feeling and if this pacing can kind of feel like you're being pulled in and out of like these lyrical moments and these scenes where we're just with them seeing just how great they are as a family uh there's something you know that we can achieve here that that is a bit rare for the climate doc sort of genre i guess um now that we're doing the feature, we are, you know, I think we we do have to have more context. We do need to, you know, have a little bit more like not stats and science first, but we need to understand in a little bit more detail what's happening. Uh, and we need to understand a little bit more what's at stake and we want to be there through a storm. We want to understand how powerful these storms are and, you know, why they're getting more powerful each, each hurricane season and all of those things. But I think for the short, you know, it was it was just a choice to say, okay, let's just make this like a, a portrait. You know, it's sort of a portrait of, of, of you know, three characters um, and that I think worked to, to our advantage. So, yeah. Do you have any input, William? No. Yeah, no, I thought that was, that was great. So there is a question. How has the rest of the island community responded to you getting the word out about their plight and bringing this focused attention to them? Um, I can I can speak to that a little bit. Um, yeah, so Sandra, I mean, we really the way that we kind of got um, introduced to the community, which was really important, was um, we were connected with someone who lived just off the island, um, and so they introduced us to most of the people on the island. I really don't think maybe Chris Brunet would talk. I mean, he talks to almost every reporter, but everyone else on the island is pretty standoffish um, because there's so much media attention. Um, but really, I think that the the most like specific example we can give was before the film premiered at South by Southwest, um, we went down to show the family the film before it was um, screened to the public. And, you know, they watched it and it was really, it was a really fun experience because they obviously were looking at different, they were looking at different things than most of us see. Um, you know, Juliet was con constantly commenting on how she looked or her fingers or her hair or something like that. Um, so that was kind of fun. But in the end, you know, they didn't have any notes. Um, they didn't have any feedback and they felt like it was really representative of what they had been experienced and who they were. Um, and, you know, we, we even had a screening at New Orleans Film Festival and, um, and they came up for it. And, and, and Juliet and Howard's grandparents were there. And, you know, I was really surprised at how supportive they are of it because we're also talking about you know, one of their children who passed away because of drug addiction and, and these sorts of things. And, um, and they just, they were comfortable with that. And they felt like it was more important um, for that story to get out than any discomfort they might have around the topic. And so I think that if you are, if you're able to be a filmmaker that is telling someone's story and you don't have a specific agenda, which is very challenging because we're all biased. We all have our own biases. Uh, but if you're able to do that, my experience is that people are always, the subjects will be surprisingly, um, surprisingly supportive. Um, and the other thing that I've really experienced uh, when with making work like this is that if you're making documentary film in the right way, it also can, it can be a therapeutic experience for them. Uh, because a lot of times 
their close community aren't, they're not asking the questions that Sandra and I are interested in. And maybe they don't have the resources to dedicate as much time as we're able to dedicate. Um, and so I think a lot of them, for at least the Brunei family specifically, working with the film, with the documentary crew has been really helpful because it's given them time and space to actually think about what is happening to them. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we honestly, we have been, you know, overwhelmed by the support that we've received with the community. You know, we are very sensitive working with them, not just because of their experience, but also, you know, most of them are indigenous and, and you know, unfortunately in, in our country, we have a long history of exploiting and marginalizing that specific community. And so, you know, we try to do as much work as possible to prepare for that. Um, but at the end, at the end of the day, it is, you know, it is our privilege to work with them and they keep, keep inviting us into their home. So it, you know, I think that that's kind of the most important component. Well, I had a question. I wanted to add to that Sandra, but we have a question on Facebook that I wanted to read. Um, so it's just a question, how did you choose this family? I guess, what was the choice behind them specifically to profile? Um, I've done a lot of work with young people. And so I think I'm just, I don't know, I'm just very drawn to the youth and I'm drawn to like people who are in these like formative years where a lot is happening and everything around, everything's like a big deal kind of. <laughs> like, I think that's just, I guess, some context of like who I am. And, and I think um, maybe, I think I was, I think I saw part of myself in like Juliet and Howard. I think saw, I saw like myself and my brother growing up. And, you know, I think I, I really connected with sort of the purity of, of them and, and how they viewed it all. And they, you know, felt like, they're such strong individuals. They've lost so much. They've been through, you know, a lot for, for their age and, and they're so strong and they're so confident in themselves, but they also have such like, you know, they're also able to be very vulnerable and, and share sort of these intimate parts of themselves. And I don't know, but when I saw, I saw a video of them when they were like 10 and 13, I think they were in the video or 10 and 12. Um, I think it was like a vice clip or a CNN clip. And this was before we went down on the island. And then I asked our local fixer that we were working with on Eldish and Charles, you know, I saw this video of these two teenagers, you know, I would love to meet them. And then he said, you know, I'll definitely introduce you. That's, you know, you know, Chris Brune that I've been telling you about. That's his niece and nephew. You're going to meet them, but I can't guarantee that they're going to want to film with you guys. And then, you know, we went to the house and I was doing an interview with Chris and we were doing interviews with lots of people. Um, and I was doing this interview with Chris and it was one of those interviews that kind of I had to do to get to the to the stuff I really wanted to get to, if that makes sense. It was very like, he took it very seriously and it was very sort of, you know, like a lot of, you know, this is where we were, this is where we are now. Like he wasn't, you know, it takes time to build trust with people. And sometimes, you know, um, you just have to show up a few times before that sort of starts happening and they, they feel they can trust you. And so I was doing this interview with Chris and Juliet, uh, came down the stairs to my left and then like Howard came and then they were like punching each other and started playing ball and just laughing and you know started being really loud and um, there was just something about them like I was just drawn to their energy I felt like on that island like they were the life like they were like they were the ones that were sort of the last young people to be in this place and they were you know they just had like a very you know sort of charismatic energy and also a deep bond between them that I felt could be a great vehicle for a story like this. Um, and so 
you know, in the beginning we weren't filming them and then slowly, you know, I was able to ask, oh, can we like, you know, can, can we film you guys playing football and things like that? And they said yes. And, you know, and then after a while of filming with them and hanging out with them, I was like, I just want to know more. I want to know more about you guys and I want to know everything. Um, but of course you also have to, you know, build a, build a relationship before you can jump into all aspects of their lives. But I just was really drawn to their energy. I was really drawn to how they, you know, empower each other as a family and their humor and, you know, how they kind of just see the beauty in the little things. Um, and also how like tough they are with each other a little bit. I felt there was, there was just a lot of uh, richness in their family. Um, and some of the other families we met with um, felt more also like they had a very set opinion and there was nothing a, around that that was going to change. It was either, you know, they're going to have to bury, they're going to have to carry me out of here in a casket, you know, uh, like I'm not going anywhere. Or it was sort of like, I'm just unhappy. We're not getting what we need, you know, and that's that, you know, like a sort of, you know, um, what I saw with the Brunei family is there was a lot of optimism. There was a lot of optimism about what this project could mean for them. There was a lot of optimism around like, but we still have this place. We can still come back here. We can still go fishing here. Like they just kind of looked at the, at the bright side of things. And I thought that was really special and, and, and beautiful. So yeah, it, it, it and it was really after our first trip, we started, we kind of put a trailer together, which is actually the trailer that we had for the film. And when we tried putting other footage in of other, you know, characters, it was like, wait, no, I want to be, I just want to be with the Brene. It's like, that feels like the right place to be, you know, there on that porch. And so on our second trip down, we were just focused on them. Um, so that's kind of how we, how we did it. Yeah. Cool. Thank Was you. there any more I see that? Um, yeah, well, we have some people thanking you um, yeah. that you're successful in telling the story of their attachment to their land and family um, and people looking forward to a longer film. Um, and we have a comment here. I think the focus on the positive feelings and not on the crisis itself makes it more powerful and able to bring you in the, into the personal impact of climate change. Yeah. yeah. I, I agree. One question. Did you get a sense that the transition to new location was a concern among members of the family? Were they engaged in substantive activities on the uh, on the island? And if so, will they be able to continue that kind of work at the new location? Um, so yeah, I can I can speak to that. Um, the, the feature that we're working on actually goes into a lot more of the indigenous narrative. Um, it, it is, it is a big part of their lives. Um, but we didn't really feel fully comfortable diving into it in the short because it felt like, you know, one of the biggest things when making any type of film is that, um, you need to be really strict on yourself of what your kind of prioritizing and that specific narrative just felt like it might be deserving of its own short in itself and we just didn't really know if we had the time to really give it as much attention as we needed in the short and so we mention it but you know there's a there's a lot more complexity that we'll be going into in the future mm -hmm. um one of the biggest divisions between the community and the government that re that is relocating the the island is this um is kind of this disregard to the indigenous part of their culture um the isle the the there's really two main tribes that are represented on the island um and one of them is not federally recognized and so i think that there has been some kind of sensitivity from the government to make sure um, that they're not really addressing it because also in our country we have very strict housing regulation that um, would not allow them to prioritize one 
community one race over another because it would it, it could be seen as discriminatory. At least that's what the government has kind of lobbied behind why they why they have disregarded this cultural aspect that they're saying because this is federal money we're not allowed to just give homes to indigenous people because that would be discriminating towards everyone else um whether that's right or wrong not really sure uh but that's that's kind of how how they they think of it um and so you know i think that from our perspective um you know, this is kind of an ongoing development for us. Um, and so, you know, uh, I, so, I, Oh, sorry. No, I, was I, was just say, say, I, was I just didn't know what the word I'm Danish. So I didn't know what the word subsist subsistence activities. Is that like sacred? Like, like fishing and hunting and oh, got it, got it. The basics off the living. Yeah. Off the yeah. Should I? So, so really, you know, what, what seems extremely obvious, and hopefully this comes across in the, in the, in the short, but it's this idea of erasure and um, really what climate change is going to do extremely effectively is erasing culture, whether that's indigenous culture or other cultures. Um, yes, we can save people's lives and move them out of harm's way, but um, you know, there's there's a there's an um, the the previous generation. Chris probably saw the tail end of this, but then the um, but his his parents and his grandparents were living solely off of what the island was providing, um, and most of most of the families down there, you know, still are fishing on a regular basis to provide um, subsistence, you know, to their diets and. Um, but, you know, 50 years ago, they were living off of gardens that they had made for produce. And really all that has gone away because the island is so regularly flooded a couple times a year, the entire island will cover up with salt water. So, you know, even, even the oak trees have started to die out because that salt water just immediately, you know, ruins all of the soil. So, mm -hmm. Are, you know, I think that the new aisle, which is what they're calling the, the, the resettlement area, um, they're trying to kind of fabricate um, that, that life again for them. Um, but, you know, I, I think everyone is aware that what nature does in creating ecosystems, especially, you know, when it, when it comes to the ocean, it's almost impossible for humanity to recreate those ecosystems. Um, it, it's, it's extremely challenging. And so, you know, it's a bit of it, it's a bit hubric, hubristic to think that we're just going to recreate the same type of lifestyle that they've had for over a hundred years in a very unique part of the world. Um, they're yeah. putting, they're putting in, um, they're, they're kind of changing the landscape and putting in like wetlands and a lake and so they are digging to change this square piece of land but this square piece of land is still next to a freeway and you know the Brene family's new backyard has like a beautiful forest on one side and then it's a chevron building on the other side you know and they also call it the chevron site because very Ironically, you know, there's a big Chevron building there and, and obviously it's not just climate change that has caused some of this, you know, erosion. It's also the oil and, you know, gas companies, you know, digging for oil and, and creating canals and with that, you know, avenues for like the water to enter um, more easily. And so they're trying on the new site to, to, to do these things um, and to also try and create like a bit of, you know, you know, like have fish and a bit of wildlife and all these things, but of course it won't be the same and how successful is it going to be and how much will they want to, you know, I mean, how Juliet will like shoot rabbits in rabbit season, right? Like how much will they actually be doing that on the new site versus going back to Il de Jean Charles? I mean, I guess time will tell, right? Like I would imagine that for a lot of those activities, they'll actually be going, they'll doing the, they'll be doing the, you know, one hour drive to Il de Jean Charles and, and, and doing it there, at least as long as it's, 
you know, safe and, and the road isn't flooded. So, yeah. Thank you. You looked like you were going to say something, Michael. I was going to ask a quick follow up, though, if you don't mind, um, just because the presence of I think oil is kind of mentioned at one point in the film. I think they're looking out at like an oil rig. And I was just curious what your plans were for the feature film. Um, and if that kind of explaining what you just explained with like the canals in addition to climate change was gonna come into it. We'll definitely, we'll definitely dive into it. Um, we're certainly more focused on um, the sort of you know, temperamental weather aspect and these hurricanes, because that's what's creating the immediate, I guess, need for safety. Um, and we're following this, you know, obviously construction. Um, but of course, it's a huge part of it. But we're not necessarily interviewing, you know, people that work for these companies. Actually, Howard and Juliet's boyfriend, Colin, worked on um, the oil rigs for a little while. Um, They're cleaning pipes. Um, and I thought that was amazing. And then they quit because they were just exhausted from that job and it, and it was very dangerous. Um, we'll definitely be talking on that. And we'll definitely, I think, go into a little bit more the, the sort of, I feel like irony isn't the right word, but this, you know, this coexistence, um, it, you know, because it, it's it's quite um, it's quite crazy that you know you you live in in this area that is seeing so many storms and and you know is losing so much land, but then at the same time, for many people, their livelihood is connected to you know working in the oil industry, and so you know the two things sort of like coexist. This like you know desire to to be safe and to, you know, stay right where you are and, you know, be in that one place that you're connected to. And then, you know, kind of contributing to some of that, you know, destruction in a way, you know, because it's the only way you can make money. So, so we're definitely like kind of going into that more and we'll see. I mean, all documentaries is sort of like a discovery, you know, if, if we feel like we're diving into that and then something really interesting pops up or there's some, you know, you know, under the, the, the Biden presidency, if there's, you know, or now that we have Biden in office, if there's new regulations or taxations all of a sudden on, on these companies, you know, that could be something that, that is put in place or happens as we're, as we're filming, then I think those are important details to include. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's kind of where we're at with it. Trying to, it's so hard. You can go in all directions and, you know, whatever you're sort of the most focused on, I think is that's where you want to put a lot of your shoot days and a lot of your energy. So you can just tell that story really, really well. But of course, there's all these sort of other threads within that main story. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's that's interesting to know that <laughs> they're kind of, it's not shocking, but yeah, like the yeah. duality of working yeah. for oil and money coming in, yeah. Yeah. Um, I cut you off before, Michael, if you had a something, a question you're going to ask. Well, the only other question I had to ask was what for each of you, the experience has brought um, change in perspective in your own life from what you learned through getting to know the family, the transition that they're needing to make because of climate change, how that's impacted you. The global question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think through my, you know, and I think this comes across in the short and hopefully I'm not steal stealing Sandra's answer, but, you know, I think it is this idea of resilience. Um, I Climate change is, you know, we kind of decided that we were going to fast forward through all the trying to convince people that climate change exists and just fast forward to it, it is, it's happening. You know, coastal erosion is happening in Louisiana. You can't, you can't deny, um, you know, you, you can't argue with Juliet that her house is in disappearing because she'll show you where the land was when she was 10 versus now when she's 18. Um, 
And I think that that's, that's really tough information for us to have. I mean, I grew up on a barrier island in Florida, and I think that that's, it's a really dire situation. It doesn't seem like there's much hope. And I think what spending so much time with the Brunets has really taught me is that, you know, being able to focus in on community and family and, and laughter and, and love, even though that sounds very cliche, um, I, I think that that's kind of what's, that's really the biggest hope we have. I think that, you know, we can figure this out as long as we stay in it together. Um, and I think that that's what really motivated us to make this film. I mean, I don't think anyone on this panel needs much convincing on the climate change side of things, but we wanted to try to entertain and secretly educate other people on the other aisle, because I do think that we need that other 50% 50 50 of people that don't really understand what's going on with climate change to partner with us because you know, we're not just going to be able to to fix this as half of the country. So I really think that's what it is. I mean, Chris Brunet has been in a wheelchair most of his life, and I've never seen anyone laugh as much as him. And he would never seem like someone who was disabled. And, you know, he's a mentor and an inspiration to me. And so I think that that's what makes us so excited to continue working with them, because they're just amazing people. And I think that um, I think that, that that's kind of what has shifted my perspective. Thank you. Yeah, should, should I answer too? Or yes, please. Answer short. I think it was just like a really um, beautiful experience, you know, before this project. I hadn't, you know, spent time with, with people so intimately. I had done some branded doc work, but I hadn't sort of, you know, done a film like this where it was just completely up to us every day waking up what are we filming today like we're doing exactly what we want to do and and you know kind of um going in and and observing these people's lives and then trying to do them justice and being able to be let in in the way that we were like just exceeded all my like expectations like um and i think the experience like william said you know same thing i was just so inspired by like their love and you know how they get through things and how they laugh you know them like how they just laugh through life and um how they you know have big dreams and hopes and aspirations and all these things but they don't put like a, a pressure on each other to, to be perfect or to, you know, do things a certain way. Like everyone in that family is free to be who they are. And that's like, you know, promoted and uplifted. And that was just really beautiful. And I think being from Copenhagen, Denmark and living in this country and perhaps in some ways feeling like I maybe even have a little bit more of like a magnifying glass up to like what's going on here than I would have if I was born here. Um, it was such a special experience to go to South Louisiana where I had never been and to meet a family that would open up in that way and and share their life experiences and and then to do it with a with a crew, a group of people, you know, that just we all just had so much fun with it and we made something I think of importance, but did it in a way where we also had fun and, you know, learned a lot about ourselves in the process. I also learned a lot more about what kind of films I want to be making. And I learned that I can, you know, be, that I'm a deep person that, that can, can uh, you know, I think that isn't afraid to go to those those places with with other people that that isn't afraid to like share in in that pain and and I don't know maybe I I'm very grateful for that I'm very grateful that it gave me the confidence that as a filmmaker you know I can I can do a feature now and feel like all right like I have faith and trust that if I'm doing it with William and you know, um, sort of following that same gut and intuition, you know, that, that I did when we did the short, like something will come out of it that hopefully can, can move people. 
Um, and I think that's, as a filmmaker, that's all you can hope for, you know, is that a project teaches you something and that it, that it re-engages you to keep exploring that story or keep exploring that side of, you know, society or, you know, these kinds of climate stories and all of that. So I, I'm just very grateful that the project did that for me. So, yeah. Well, as a, as a storyteller myself, I just want to say how much I appreciate the way that you made the space for the story to reveal itself and then did a great job of telling it very organically and naturally, which is not easy to do. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thank you both. Um, yeah. I also want to say as someone who's from the US, but I've never been south of like Kentucky, I that was very eye opening for me as well. Um, to see that like part of our country. I loved it. So Oh, well, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, and I do want to read there's a comment here. We talk about climate resiliency a lot, but this is a guide to how important human resilience is and will be as we move through this. Thank you. It's a comment. I love that. Um, so, oh, yeah, I don't have any more questions. Is there anything else that you two felt like you wanted to share? I think we've covered a lot of great things. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 You're happy. We're happy. <laughs> yeah. <so laughs> in the future, we're we're still thinking it's going to be called Lowland Kids, so you can keep an eye out for that. Um, we've gone back and forth on the title, but we love Lowland Kids too much to leave it behind. So. Um, <laughs> it's a great a, title. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. You'll follow up with more news on that for sure. Okay. Yeah. Keep us posted. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. We'll definitely. We'll definitely feature your feature film when it comes out. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank all. you so much for having Thank us. You. All right. Exactly. Have a good one. You too. Okay, bye. Bye. I know. <laughs>